think with me, if you will, about two married couples. One couple, excited when they get married, as, as most are. If you're not, you're in trouble. Um, and, and they're excited about getting married. And as they go through life and the years take their toll, um, they, they lose the flame and eventually the wife looks at her husband and says, I'm done with this. I'm actually seeing another person, great guy, actually pursues me. I'm out of here. And the husband's sitting down in his chair um, on, his, on his Xbox One playing some games. And uh, he's like, really? All right, well, do whatever you think is best. You know, I'm, I'm going to support you in whatever decision you want. She says, all right, bags are packed, I'm gone. So that's scenario one. Scenario two, another married couple, excited getting married, um, going through life, things get tough. Wife looks at her husband, says, you know what, I'm tired of this. I'm out of here, I'm seeing another guy. Except in this case, the husband gets upset. He actually gets mad and, and frustrated and, and just all these swirl of emotions as he's trying to process what, what his wife of eight years is saying to him. All this time that he invested, all of, all of, these, um, all of these days and weeks and months and years and these commitments, the moments they've shared together, all of these things are swirling around in his mind as he's trying to process that she is now going to leave him. And he's, he's angry. Uh, and and he's, he's trying to think through. He says, what are you doing? Why are you throwing this all away? Let's sit down. Let's talk about this. Let's work through this. Let's fight through this. Let's, let's figure this out. Contrast the two. Compare the two. Which husband would you say loves his wife more? I think most of us would say the husband that got angry and frustrated at the news that his wife is running off with another guy. Would anyone disagree? I'll put you on the spot. No, I, I don't think anyone would come talk with me after. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. But, um, but if you think about love in the way we typically think about love, we don't honestly consider love to be full of strong negative emotions. We only consider strong positive emotions. And that's exactly where Paul goes with us tonight as we're going through Romans 12, 9 through 21. You see, true love, true biblical love has texture. It, it is not squishy, nor, nor is it just cold. It, it is appropriate to circumstances. And, and the problem is we're used to kind of a flattened out, streamlined, one-dimensional form of love that we think about all the time, that we hear about all the time. Our, our culture has equated love with affirming individual autonomy, right? How do I love my friend? How do I love this person or that person? Well, I want to affirm them in whatever they want to go after. If, if that's what you want, go for it. I don't want to give a moral judgment on you. I don't want to work into that space at all. I just want to step back and say, kind of be your cheerleader. Go, go, go. Do it, do it. But the reality is that's, honestly, it's a cop-out. It's a safe zone that we, we find as we back away from, from actually having weight in someone's life and influence. And the, the funny thing is, we still draw lines about love. We still draw lines all around love. There are limits to how far you will go to support another person, right? Would you support someone who wanted to hurt themselves or wanted to cut themselves? You say, you know what, go on ahead. If you think that's right for you, do it. Well, of course not. We, we would make a moral judgment at that point and say, you're causing harm or you want to cause harm. Let's get you some help. Let's, let's step in and intervene and try to help you with that. What about if someone had a drug addiction? Would you just say, you know what, that's for you. Go do your thing. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're doing what you want. Or would we step in and intervene and, and try to help? We still draw lines. We just draw them further back to where we kind of get out of the fray. We get out of the mess a little bit. And what Paul's doing here in this passage is he's sticking us right in the middle of the mess. That's what he's doing. And I think we really, we're tempted to lower our standards of love in order to absolve ourselves of that responsibility, that mess. 
It's easy to treat everyone the same when we have this lowest common denominator view of love. Do whatever you think is best when really we're just trying to protect ourselves from risking anything. So the question I think Paul's answering for us tonight and what we want to think about is where do you draw the line? How do we define love within the context of a Christian community? Now that has implications for husbands and wives. That has implications for parents and children. That has implications for students on campus. That has implications, of course, like I said, in the local church. But what we're trying to answer is where do we draw those lines? What is that definition of how we live in community with each other? What is our obligation in love towards one another? And so with that in mind, I want us to jump into this text, but let's pray first again. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just ask for, for you to move with your spirit. Open our hearts to understand your word. Lord, we just ask that you would, that you would shave off those calluses on our hearts that are resistant to your truth. And, and Lord, help us to receive with meekness your word, which is able to save our souls. Lord, help us to understand what true love is. It's in Christ's name we pray all this. Amen. So, as we head into the text about this Christian culture of love that Paul's trying to tackle, I, I want to just real quick start us off with three foundational truths that are going to establish a baseline for where we're going. Because, honestly, if you were listening to the reading of the Word, if you've ever read through this passage before, it's a whole lot of imperatives. Do this. Do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. And some people think that's all Christianity is, but when you read the Bible, most of the Bible's not that. Most of the Bible's narrative. And so I, I think Tyler was just having some fun giving me this one um, with all these imperatives that, that are hard to string together. But I, I, I do think there's a pattern. And, um, but before we get into these imperatives, what you ought to do as, as a Christian or as a creation of God, what your responsibility is towards other people in love, we have to have a foundation or a baseline to get to the imperatives because if we don't understand where we're coming out of, then commanding you to love is going to be problematic because you and I are sinners and we don't obey that well. So uh, three quick baselines. One, the gospel motivates our love. The gospel motivates our love. John 13, Jesus is in the upper room right before he is going to the cross to display his, his greatest act of love, if you will, towards mankind. He says, love one another as I have loved you. So as he commands them, love one another, he says there's a, there's a, there's a, a form for that. There's, a, there's something that you need to base your love off of, and that is my love for you. And so when we look at the love of Christ towards us, that's our baseline, that's our motivation for how we love others. And, and we see that in the gospel, right? For those of you that are Christian here, think of the time when you became a Christian or that time in that season when you were changing, you were understanding who God was in His holiness and His perfection. And then in the midst of that, how you felt convicted about sin. And, and there, was, there was a contrast and you, you sensed the ugliness of your sin. And that drove you to cry out to Him for grace. And then as you look at the cross of Christ, you see that grace. You see that love that while we were enemies... Christ died for us. And so we have this gospel framework as he drew us to him and as he keeps drawing us even after we're Christians, right? Because we don't stop sinning and we still keep reenacting this gospel understanding. We find that that love that he has shown us in Christ is our motivation for loving others. And if we don't understand the love of God in Christ, we will never be able to love others the way God has called us to. So that's one, the gospel motivates our love. And really we see that in Romans 12. Um, two weeks ago when Tyler was teaching and he says, uh, verse one, I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God in view of God's mercy, right? Romans one through 11 is not heavy on imperatives. And once you get to 12 and following, you have these imperatives, commands, but they're based on the gospel he's just proclaimed. And so in view of God's mercy, here's what you ought to do. So remember that the gospel motivates our love. Second foundation, the gospel flavors our love. It flavors our love. What does it flavor it with, you ask? Um, humility, I would think, from Scripture. So 
Uh, think, of, think of 1 Corinthians 13. Love does not insist on its own way. It, it endures all things. It hopes all things. And when we look at the gospel, we see that the gospel puts us in our proper place. It helps us understand that the universe doesn't revolve around us, right? We're not the center. We've had a Copernican revolution in our thought. God is at the center. We are revolving around him, and that humbles us. That, that gives us a, dispos uh, a disposition that ought to be others first, me second. And that's how our love is flavored. Um, it, and it also shows us our responsibility towards each other. So if I'm supposed to serve others, what are my responsibilities? That's what Tyler went through last week. He's just talking about understanding how um, our, our bodies relate to God and, to one, and, and God's body, how we're connected to the body of Christ. So we need to understand the gospel flavors our love with this humility. And that's why Paul says in verse 3, I say to everyone among you do not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. The gospel tells us how we ought to think of ourselves. We are sinners we are in need of God's grace, but we're also loved of God and children of God. So that should give us humility. Third baseline truth we need to understand, the gospel distinguishes our love from the world's love. The gospel distinguishes our love from the world's love. Back in John 13, uh, Jesus continues talking to his disciples in the upper room, and he says, By this the world will know that you are my disciples, if you have good potlucks. Wait, sorry, I misread it. Um, just Oh, is that just a Baptist thing? Sorry. Um, if you, let's see, if you go to GCF every Thursday, is that, or you, you can check your box, you went to church at least every other Sunday, right? You got in the van, got your FaceTime. Uh, no, that you love one another. That is the distinguishing mark of the church. And you say, wait a second, no, 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 the gospel is what distinguishes us. Well, of course. <laughs> our love for one another is the gospel played out in our lives. So, so the gospel distinguishes our love from the world's love. And, and the whole reason Paul includes this section here of imperatives is because he's reacting against the way our world typically thinks of love, right? Why would he have to tell, why would he have to tell us, let love be genuine if our love wasn't always genuine? We need that command because we struggle. We struggle to love one another. And so these, these commands, there are 22 in all, are designed to help set apart the local church, to distinguish this community apart from every other culture in our world. Now, some, I'll probably use the world or our culture, and I understand there are different cultures, there are many different cultures, many different um, uh, contexts, if you will, but the local church, even though they are embedded in different cultures, has its own unique culture. And Paul is describing to us in one of the most articulate and practical places in the whole Bible what that looks like. So, um, so those are your three things. Gospel motivates our love, it flavors our love with humility, and it distinguishes our love from the world. Sets apart the church community. So, so as we tackle this text, Paul offers really six principles, I think, of genuine love that ought to shape the community of the local church. And, and the whole passage, I think, is addressed by that first command in verse 9, let love be genuine. Uh, another way to say it is let love be without hypocrisy. Right? We always like to link church with hypocrisy because you know of people at church that are hypocrites. Or maybe I'm the only one that knows people at church that are hypocrites. But I, I, I think you do. We see people say one thing, do one thing on Sunday, that they were certainly not doing Saturday evening or Friday evening. How do we deal with that? Well, first of all, we need to turn the focus on ourselves, and that's exactly what Paul is doing. And so I ask you again, why would Paul sense the need to say that? Because we are hypocrites. Wouldn't you assume love is genuine, though? Right? He used the word agape. Let your agape be genuine. How can agape not be genuine? All the time. It doesn't take long to figure out that we struggle with this in church. And, and so as you look at the ideal, uh, Paul goes through that in verses 4 through 8, right? He talks about these spiritual gifts. Here's how you need to serve one another. If prophecy, um, 
uh, in proportion to your faith. If service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, and do all these things out of humility. Great, there's your benchmark. Now, go to church on Sunday and, and go to that person that you really struggle with and, and try to live that out. That's the hard part. And that's why Paul goes from this ideal here, here's what you ought to be doing, and he kind of wades into the nitty-gritty practical details in verses 9 through 21, saying here's some advice on how to let your love be without hypocrisy. You see, I don't think anyone doubts the sincerity or their own sincerity when they're standing at the altar making a pledge to their spouse. Like I said before, if there was doubts there, um, that's a problem. And yet, I guarantee you, you'll have second thoughts when you smell their morning breath or when they gain more weight or when they disregard your advice and do something stupid with your finances. You see, that's where the rubber meets the road. And, and that's where these ideals, oh, I, I see what God is. I see that God is love. I see what he's called me to do. How do we reconcile that when our world doesn't reflect that? And this is what Paul is getting at here. We have to, we must grapple with the evil in our world and the evil in our hearts. It'd be easy if we lived in Eden, um, but we got kicked out for fighting. So what are we going to do? Well, we need to look to the gospel and we need to look through to passages such as Romans 12. <clears throat> so uh, starting out, Paul offers these, these two ways in which we can make sure our love is genuine and authentic. One is abhor what is evil. Don't you like that word abhor? That's just very, very strong. Abhor what is evil and, and, and hold fast or cling to, I like that terminology, what is good. When I think of uh, abhor, I think of one time I was in college. I won't tell you how many years ago. But I was at the dining hall and I got myself a bowl of cereal because praise God in college, cereal's good any time. Heck, it's still good any time. Uh, I had two bowls last night late. And so I got my bowl of cereal. I sat down, got a spoon in it, and went to take a bite. Yeah, there was a problem with that bite. It wasn't in the cereal. It was the goop that was stuck to the bottom of the spoon that I didn't see because it didn't get washed. And so I, I grabbed it out of the clean tray, but there was definitely some sicky stuff, some hair, and some other things on it. And yeah, I've grossed you out now. And, and you, I'm, I'm talking with my then girlfriend, now wife, and, and I take this bite, I pause, and I just spit it all back in the bowl. I just, bleh, it was nasty. And normally I can handle stuff like, I don't get grossed out easily, I'll just chew it up and swallow it, but that was gross. And, and, and when you think of the word abhor, think of the word despise, think of the word repulsed, be repulsed by this. Abhor what is evil, hate, despise it, and hold fast to, cling to what is good. Actually, the word hold fast or cling is the same word used between a husband and a wife when, uh, when a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. So think about abhor what is evil, avoid that altogether, and cling to what is good. And, and true love does both. I wanted to play off a phrase, true love hates. You know, it doesn't just wait, it hates. True love hates evil. But that's still just one side of it. But, but I think we need to understand that. We need to abhor our sin and cling to what is good. And so this is the defining mark of a growing Christian. They discern good from evil. They, they're maturing and they're be able, being able to recognize both in their hearts, starting in their hearts, and also in the world, good from evil. They put off the old man, they put on the new. You see, most Christians are aware of the put-on commands. We're aware we need to do this and that to be Christians, to grow as Christians. But what we don't think about as much is the put-off, the stop, the abhor. We, we overlook the sin-fighting side. And no, this doesn't involve you being Batman, going around in Gotham, fighting crime. Rather, it involves the God-man working his salvation in your sinful hearts and mine. 
So as we work through this list of imperatives, there's, like I said, six contrasts that I think we're, we're commanded to follow here. And so we're in each one, as I group them together, we'll see a, something we ought to hate, despise, abhor, something we ought to cling to. So let's run through these here before time gets away from us. <clears throat> uh, the first principle here is hate self-promotion and cling to honoring others. Hate self-promotion and cling to honoring others. And that's found in verse 10. Here's what he says. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So now you might say, wait, where does he say hate self-promotion? I think it's implicit here, and it's also in other passages. So even though he doesn't explicitly state the problem here, we know from other passages such as 1 Corinthians 1, Philippians 2, that the local church, even in the first century, struggled with self-promotion. They struggled with competition in much the same way a couple of brothers might. And so, so those within the church community would always try to one-up each other. So some would say, well, I was baptized by Apollos. He's a very notable preacher. You may have heard of him. Another guy goes, well, guess what? Paul the Apostle baptized me. And, and so there was this jockeying for position. There was this, this self-promotion that caused them to say, let's do it my way. I know a little better. Here's who I rub shoulders with. And, and, and Paul seeks to squash it in many different places here. And so I think he hints a little bit here. If you have to compete like siblings, if you're going to compete, outdo one another. Let it be by honoring and not by pushing the other person down and pushing yourself up. Remember last week, Tyler's examples of test scores. You get a test score and you're asking other people, what did you get? Just out of curiosity. What you're doing is you're ranking in your mind. How'd they do? How'd I do? And, um, and there's this, always a sense of self promotion that we want to say. How can, how can we um, make ourselves look good? We have an innate desire to know where we stand in comparison to others, and Facebook really does not help. For me growing up, and, and even to some extent now, not as much athleticism, although it used to be, um, music was another one, and, and my Christian walk. So those were the three big ones. Whenever I would, would meet a new group of people, I would always kind of size them up, and, and the guys especially who were my age, right? Um, could I compete with them athletically? You know, um, I'm, I'm musically talented. You know, I got that on them, even if they can beat me athletically. Or, and, and I mean, if they're good at music and athletic, they're probably prideful, so they're not a good Christian, so I'll have them in that category. And, uh, and I mean, that's convoluted, isn't it? And, and so that's the way my mind thought. Now, would I tell that to you when I was 17? No, I probably didn't even understand it. I was just, that was naturally how I operated. Um, but God, through God's grace, He reveals these things to me and is showing me my sin. And, and so I'm understanding these things. And it might be the same for you. It might be different. For you, it might be looks. It might be success in the world's eyes. It might be humor. That's a big one at college. You always want to be the funny person. You always be, at least I did. You always want to be the one that would crack the joke or that everyone liked to hang, around, hang out with. You know, you're sitting around on a Friday night waiting for someone to call me. Hey, you want to go do this? You end up just eating a bunch of ice cream and Chinese food. Um, and, and so you want to be humorous or you want to be the good grade person. Maybe, maybe you're that person. Well, but what Paul is saying is that spirit of self-promotion must stop. It does us no good to rest in those idols and find our identity in those things over and apart from Christ. We need to abhor self-promotion. Notice I did not say you must hate yourself. That's not what I'm saying. This, in fact, would be another form of idolatry, right? Self-loathing. I'm not who I should be. I'm not what I want to be. So therefore, I'm going to hate on myself. Same, it's the same idolatry. It's just different terminology. You want yourself to be that, and that's where you find your salvation. And so when you don't have it, you get depressed. Paul is calling us to something greater. In the times I've met with uh, KJ, a pastor at Sovereign Hope, he always says, the cross is always your greatest accuser as well as your salvation. And that just stuck with me. So what, what is Paul pointing us toward? If we need to abhor this self-promotion, what ought we to do? Well, cling to honoring one another. Cling, cling to faithfulness to one another. Don't just be competitive like brothers. Be faithful like brothers. 
I, I was, um, I'll, I'll confess this real quick. I was traveling last year and Tyler came and preached at our church, a little small church out by the Y. And, um, and the next week when I got back, everyone was raving about Tyler's sermon. They were like, and he's going to have to repent of pride after this too. But, but so they're raving about his sermon and, and they're telling me, it was so good, you know, it was so encouraging, it was great. And I'm back and I'm thinking, man, it'd be nice to get a welcome back, pastor. Or uh, yeah, it'd be nice if you came up to me with that much zeal after one of my sermons. And, and so I, you know, it just, just creeps up. And so, and, and pastors will tell you, anyone will tell you, right? When you're a pastor, you, you compare yourself to other people. And so you have to fight that tendency all the time. The best way to fight it is to praise other people. Is to not flatter them, but show them honor. And some people, it's hard to find things to praise them about, isn't it? Right? So those, those people that you struggle with loving, it's hard to, hey, you know what? You're, you did a great walk in the class today. Good job. You know, and, and so you just, but, but if, if, you, if you're diligent, you can find evidences of grace, God's grace in their life that you can point out and encourage them with. And so if you're struggling with self-promotion, you're intimidated by other people, or you, you're trying to make yourself look good in the midst of other people, outdo one another in honoring people. Point out God's grace to them in their lives, however small that may appear at times. Um, so that's the encouragement. You know, maybe, maybe they're watching kids every Sunday at church, and you, you notice that. You know, congratulate them, encourage them for it. It's not easy watching kids in the nursery. Um, maybe you notice them representing Christ in a class discussion where you would never even go near something like that. Uh, go up and encourage them afterwards. Don't worry about how it makes you look. Uh, a good book on this, if you want to do more about that, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness by Tim Keller. It's short and sweet, but very, very concise and good. So that's one. Help, hate self-promotion. Cling to honoring others. Principle two, hate laziness and cling to zealousness or diligence. Hate laziness and cling to zealousness. Yes, I understand. I'm on a college campus. And the, the temptation is definitely uh, laziness in some things. At least it was for me. So this, this, uh, this term here um, that he, well, let's read the verse and then we'll go from there. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. All right, so don't be lacking in zeal. What does he mean by that? Well, really, you could say even lagging. It's someone who's kind of lagging behind in, in zeal. So if, if, if the church is excited and moving, and there's one person that's kind of jogging like 30 feet back and... Like, I'll get there when I get there. That's that lacking in zeal. There's not fervor in them. It has nothing to do with your ability to run. I promise you. Um, it, it's someone who doesn't keep up. They just get by, right? C's get degrees. That's what we said. Um, this is akin to the parable of the man who buried his talent instead of investing it. Now, you may be a one-talent person, and you may be a C-level student, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if, you're, if you have the capability of being an A-level student and you're getting by with C's because you're being passive or, or lazy, that's an area that God is wanting you to <laughs> work on. So, and again, this isn't just relating to your class studies. This is relating to your Christian life, how you love other people, how you interact with other people. So, hate laziness. Passivity is the attitude that permeates our hearts, which seeks to relieve, of, relieve us of responsibility. Right? We, we avoid tough effort because we, we fear failure. We prefer to zone out on Netflix or BuzzFeed or some video games instead of facing the real issues in our lives. Now, there's nothing wrong with Facebook or BuzzFeed or Netflix. Um, but the issue is why are we running to those things? And a lot of times it's to avoid other things. So, we, we must develop a keen distaste for this attitude of passivity. Perhaps fast from some of those things. Perhaps um, have someone hold you accountable. But do some soul searching. Do some thinking. Turn the music off. Get into a quiet place and reflect. Hate passivity. Instead, what did he tell us to do? Cling to diligence or zealousness. 
Be fervent in spirit, he says. Literally, fervent means hot or boiling over. So, so when he's saying be fervent in spirit, imagine something that just stirred your heart. Maybe it was a book you read or a movie you watched or something that just kind of stirred you for something greater. It happens to me every time I watch Band of Brothers. And, and I, just, I just see some heroism there. And it just, man, it just pumps me up for the Christian walk. I'm like, I'm doing the same thing they're doing. I'm doing something more important than what they're doing. And yet, I honestly, I don't treat it that way oftentimes. <laughs> kind of marching in the back of the line or tempted to often. But we're commanded to be fervent in spirit. Maybe some of you, when you became a Christian, you had this zeal, this excitement and then it's kind of waned over the years. Now, I, I don't think Paul is saying, you got to get back to that zeal when you first became a Christian because then you're just trying to manufacture an emotion that you had based on your situation in life. I think what he's pointing us towards is going back to the well, going back to where we drew from before and where we can draw from again, and that's the gospel. We, <laughs> we can't just tell our spirit, hey, spirit, stop that. You know, there, there has to be some work that God does in us through that, but yet that doesn't absolve us from responsibility. You know, I, I always wrestle with these passages where it says, knock and the door will be opened unto you, you know, seek and you will find. Um, and so, and so it, there's this responsibility I have, but at the same time an acknowledgement that it's God who does it in me. And so we can't cancel one out over the other. Do not lack in zeal. Pursue zealousness. Pursue this spirit-fueled, gospel-fueled energy to do the work of the local church as Christ's representative. So, I think verse 12 shows us how we can remain fervent in our service to God when it gets difficult. He just gives us three things real quick. Rejoice in hope, right? So, if you don't know what you're striving for, what your main goal is, you're going to wear out. You're going to get tired. So, you need to rejoice in the hope. Think of the big picture. Think that, that Christ is going to return that, that this struggle has an end, there's a goal, and it's in His hands, not yours. That can, cause you, that can help you rejoice in the midst of whatever trial you're in. The second thing He says is endure, um, endure trial. So this has the idea of don't just get to a problem, stay under it for a while and be like, nah, this ain't for me, I'm out. Um, endure it. Hang with it. So when you're trying to love someone and they're not reciprocating that back, hang in there. Man, this last summer... Uh, we were trying to help a family out in our neighborhood, and, and turns out they had a meth issue, and, and it was just going from bad to worse, and, and they had a little girl about our girl's age, so we're trying to help them, and there's like domestic abuse and all these other things going on, and we're getting burnt out. I mean, it was, it was so tempting just to say, you know what, you guys, you know, like, later. Sorry, not sorry. And, and, and so we were just ready to pack it up, but then there's this gospel drive in us that says, remain in this. Continue striving with them. And you know what? They're not part of our church today. One's in jail. But, but there was a sense in which God was glorified because we remained in that trial and we testified of His gospel. At least, I hope we did clearly to them. There's a lot of trials you're going to face. Remain under them as long as, obviously, you're, you have biblical warrant to stay in that. So, uh, rejoice in hope, uh, be patient in affliction or, or in trial, and, and be constant in prayer. If you're doing the first two, I'm pretty sure you'll be doing the last one. Um, that's, that's how you maintain that zeal. Understand the big picture, remain in those struggles, and keep that communication with God open. Talk to Him. Prayer reminds us that we don't just obey commands as Christians. We are led by a shepherd. And it is at his feet that we find strength and peace for that journey ahead. So we have to, we have to press on here. I don't want to keep you here all night. Principle number three. Hate greed and cling to giving. Hate greed, cling to giving. Look at verse 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Again, we have to ask, why else would Paul command this if it were not difficult for them to do so? Right? should be obvious. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Don't you think everyone would do that? Mm, wrong. Apparently, some needs were not getting met. Very early on in the book of Acts, you have um, some widows 
who were of a different race than the Jews not getting certain portions because we prefer the Jewish widows first. Needs were not getting met. So what are we commanded to do? Well, we need to, we need to hate this greed. We need to despise this greed. In our culture, I can't say it's gotten any better, right? We are advertised to constantly. You go to click a video, watch a video, you got to watch this five or 15 second commercial. And we're just trained. We're, we're used to being told what we need. And we're used to passively sitting and watching. You know, I try to train my girls when I like to watch football. That's about the only time I watch actually network, network TV. The rest of the time it's Netflix or something. Um, but we, we get commercials that come on a lot. And so I train my, my two four-year-olds. I say, what are they trying to sell us? And so every time a commercial comes on, most of it's cars or alcohol that they think is soda. Um, <laughs> and so, so they're like, ooh, daddy, a, no so a, a new soda. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I, what are they trying to sell you? What do they want you to buy, Grace? What do they want you to buy, Nora? And I'm trying to help them think. Don't just sit there passively and, and hear that they need this. Understand there's an agenda behind that. And recognize, is this something I need or not? I mean, I, I guess I need a BMW. That'd be nice. Um, so greed just permeates our, our culture, right? We're, we're told you got to make money. <laughs> 21 pilots, right? Wake up, you need to make money. Come on. It's not those good old days where you just use your imagination. This is the real world. You need to go out and get something for yourself. But this is, this is the beautiful thing about God's kingdom. He just loves to take how our world operates and turn it on its head. He's just like, you know what? That looks better the other way around. Let's just twist that. And so <laughs> it's like this hourglass. You flip it over, all of a sudden it starts going down the other way. And you're like, it works. Um, and so what God said is, you want to save your life? Lose it. Guess what? It, you, you're worried about stuff. You're worried about having what you need? Seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, and guess what? That stuff will come when you need it. It'll be added to you. Don't worry about that. He says the kingdom of God is like a man who finds a, a jewel in a field, so he goes out and sells everything he has just to buy that field. These are the commands of Scripture. They want us to work backwards from how our hearts and our cultures typically work. Don't go out and grab You'll find the wealthiest people, maybe not numerically, but definitely in their life, are the ones that give. We need to detest grabbing. We need to detest that hoarding. And, and we need to cure it by really, by giving. Cling to giving of, of your finances, of yourself. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And this is a tough one because most of us aren't even aware of needs. Like, and, and in our culture, we don't have as much poverty as, say, the first century church did. But it's there. We just have to be keen to watch and to be observant and to look. Plus your college students, because so you don't, right, it's not like you have, you know, a $4,000 a month budget to balance. <laughs> You're just trying to get by. I like this quote that C.S. Lewis gave about giving. He says, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc. is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we're probably, not, or we're probably giving way too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. That's biblical giving. Not giving out of your overflow. Giving out of your need. Seek to show hospitality is another way to do it. Now, it doesn't require as much money as it does effort, especially since you guys don't have a home, the typical way we think about hospitality, hosting people. But really, hospitality is a disposition of, of using yourself and your resources to serve another's need. See a new person at church, go up there, initiate, talk with them. Or maybe there's a person that's been at church for a while nobody likes. Guess what? Get them. Go after them. Be hospitable. Invite them to lunch. Principle number four. Hate bitterness, 
cling to blessing. Hate bitterness, cling to blessing, verses 14 and 15. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. It's one thing to love people who are lovable. I mean, it's hard enough to do that. I mean, my wife, great person, great person. I'd say she's in the top 5% of anybody on the planet. So, so it's hard for me to love her sometimes. Now take someone from the bottom 5%. Take someone who's, who's persecuting me either for my faith or just being evil towards me for some reason. How much harder is it to love them, to bless them? Paul is up in the ante here. Our nature when punched is to punch back, or at least we want to, right? And when we're powerless to retaliate, this, this bitterness wells up in our heart. I, I can, I'm a pretty cool, calm, and collected guy. Most people wouldn't call me an angry person until I get behind the wheel of a vehicle. And, and then it's like Mad Max. I am ready to go. Like, I, dude cuts me off. I'm like, I am tailing you, you know, or, or I see someone coming up and they're weaving through traffic. I'm like, I'm going to pull next to this car and match their speed just so he can't get around. Like, I'm going to do that because I am the sheriff in town and you're not getting around me. And, and so I had, I mean, it's, it's horrible. And, and there, are, there are times I actually wish, or, or uh, you know, they, they zip around me real fast, put me in danger. I'm like, I hope they get in a wreck up there. I hope they just flip that vehicle and they learn their lesson. And then they drive by and there's like a car seat in the back with a little cute girl. I'm like, oh, I'm such a sinner. Like, <laughs> this, is, this is horrible. And so, you know, and, and I get brought down to real life here. And that's just driving. What if people are dragging your parents to jail, putting a bullet through their head because they're a Christian. How much harder is it to, to bless those people when you're weak and powerless to fight back? Yet this is what Paul commands. And not to go the way of bitterness, right? There are a lot of people in, in church that see things they don't like. And it's probably not even persecution, yet we grow bitter and cold and, and angry at things we can't change. And Paul says we have to fight that. We have to fight that. Do not curse other people. Do not wish harm on other people. Instead, do what? Cling to blessing. Bless those people that you want to curse. Again, that's a work of him, not of me. So, cling to blessing. Seek their good in Christ. Because, honestly, that's what Christ did for you, Romans 5.8. You heard it earlier this semester, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Later on in verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, how much more now that we're reconciled shall we be saved by His life? You were the enemy that He blessed you have no right to curse your enemies. No ground. Bless them. And do it through the power of the gospel. Principle five. Hate pride, cling to humble living. Hate pride, cling to humble living. Verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Go on ahead at some point, write, write down next to this Proverbs 26, 1 through 12. Proverbs 26, 1 through 12, if you write in your Bibles, that is, or in your notes. And, and go on ahead at some point, go home and read verses 1 through 11, and he's going to tell you how bad a fool is. He's just going to, he's just going to rake the fool over the coals and just, I mean undo how ridiculous a foolish person is. And then in verse 12, he turns the knife. And he says, do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for that worthless fool than there is for that guy. And, and what, what Paul is trying to do is draw off that and show us that we need to hate that pride that wells up in our hearts, that wants to set us apart from other people in our church community or elsewhere that makes us think we're, we're better in some way because we can do this better or that better. 
And let me tell you, I find it challenging enough in my own life to fight that. Try, imagine fighting that in a four-year-old. I mean, my daughter wants to be good at everything. And, and, and if it's like, I'm trying to encourage her to shoot this basketball, make a basket. And if she can't do it the first time, she's like, I can't do it. And she just becomes this rage monster. And, and, and I'm, I'm like, you need to practice. You need to miss a lot in order to get it right. But the moment she gets it right, I'm the best in the world. Nobody's better than me, daddy. That's what she says. <laughs> and I'm like, you're my daughter. Uh, yeah. it's, it's just, it's innate in us to want to praise us when we do good and to be angry when we don't. So, hate pride, cling to humble living. One thing about our wealth in, in this culture is that it, wealth tends to divide people. So when you're wealthy, you're not living as much in community, right? If you can afford your own house, you're not going to live with grandparents or parents. But when you're poor, you're going to have multi-generations, you're going to have multi-families living together. We're, we're all up in each other's business. And so wealth tends to divide us and separate us. And because of that, we don't have to affiliate with some people we don't like to affiliate with. I, I grew up um, much, of, much of my childhood in substandard living, I'll say that. Um, motel, a trailer, or some type of shack. And you know, to me growing up, it wasn't that big a deal. But then once I kind of got out of that and I went to college and, and kind of understood there were stratospheres of, of social living, I, I almost looked on it with disdain, like, man, I'm glad I got out of that. And the Lord goes on ahead and plants our church right in a trailer park up at the Y and uh, teaches me a lesson. We need to associate with the lowly. And especially if you struggle with that, go do it. Go, go spend some time associating with people whom you would not typically esteem. It will do your heart much good to remind you that you are of no more value to God than they are. So, last principle, and this summarizes the whole thing really. It says, hate personal retribution you like all those syllables? I'm not very alliterated here. Hate personal retribution and cling to peace. Verses 17 through 20. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. And I'll throw in 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You notice how that good and evil bracket our passage Right? Look in verse 9. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And then in the verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It brackets it to show us something. If we're not fighting that evil, if we're not resisting that evil, if we're not hating that evil, we're going to be overcome by it. It's our nature, our, our sinful nature. And praise God for those of you who are Christian, you have the Spirit working in you, and, and, and He is going to overpower that sinful nature as He works through your desires. But the fight is still being waged. Hate personal retribution and cling to peace. Jesus drove this truth very deep into the hearts of men, especially the Jews, at the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus plays off a, a, a Jewish benchmark, if you will. It was called this principle of lex talionis. Um, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. If, if you steal an apple, you get that stolen. And so there was this retribution mindset. And it was in the Old Testament, it functioned that way. The state was to, if, if your neighbor killed your ox, they get to take, or you get to take theirs. So there's this balancing, this, this justice, if you will. And, and so 
what the Jewish people would do is say, I have a right to hate my enemy. Rome has enslaved us. We are no longer uh, sovereign like we were before. So therefore, we can hate our enemies because they have done bad to us. So we're justified by this principle. And, and, and Jesus just, just takes it to them. And he says, you, you know, you've heard that it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. I mean, I can't imagine how many jaws dropped when he said that. You see, we all have an innate sense of justice in our, in our lives. You have a justice meter in your mind. And it's because we're, we're made in the image of God like that. But the problem is, Sin has warped that justice meter in your brain and my brain. And, and, and the scales of our hearts are off. And so we see justice through our own lens, our own eyes alone, and not through the holy law of God. So this, this command here is similar to command four, right? Don't, don't curse, but bless. But I think here... It's don't retaliate. So whereas in, in the command four, you couldn't, you're being persecuted. Don't be bitter. Don't curse them. Here, don't fight back. Don't, don't trade evil for evil. <laughs> the biggest thing I can think about is this political campaign and you get the mudslinging that goes on. And, and boy, it has been a dumpster fire this time around. Um, it, it's just bad. And so, you know, there's a couple of guys that I'm following and, and uh, you know, Trump normally, anyway, I'm going to stop. He gets his, yeah. He says some inflammatory things. And uh, there's another candidate who said, I I'm not going to go to personal attacks. And eventually he goes to personal attacks and starts making references to his hands and such. And uh, I'm like, dude, you're, a, you're, you're running for president. Don't try to retaliate. But that's what our hearts do. That's what the, the leaders of, of our free nation do. No one is above that. We have sinful, warped views of justice where we want to retaliate and we want to repay evil for evil. But we need to be people of peace. We need to seek for peace. If at all possible, and notice he clarifies that, if at all possible, seek for peace. So as I close, let me ask you, how can we seek for peace? Where do, what right do we have to say, you know what? I'm going to seek for peace and I'm not going to retaliate when you are clearly doing evil. Where do we find our justice? The only place we find our justice is in God's promise. The only place we find it is there. And we need to understand something. Because our God is a God of love, He's also a God of hate. Because hate is not the opposite of love. Indifference is the opposite of love. See, if someone loves passionately and strongly, anything that threatens that love, anything that works against that pure love, is going to have a bullseye on it. Whereas if someone's indifferent, it doesn't matter. Do whatever. So when it comes to us as Christians, living out God's love among us, if you're being wronged, I like how Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. He's like, Let, so what? Let them, if they take something from you, don't take them to court, you know? If they take your stove, give them your fridge too. Just like deal with it, but don't take personal offense to it. How can we do that and say it's okay? We can do that because God says vengeance is mine. I will repay. God is the one who meets out justice, not you and not me. And that should make us cringe when we want justice, but it should also make us hope when we lack the ability to bring justice. And let me tell you, you're a college student. There's a lot in the world you want to change. Go out and do your best, but it's too big for you. You're called to be a difference maker. You're called to go do this. But the only way you're going to ultimately have victory is through the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. And that is where our hope is placed. The wrath of God 
judging sin and bringing stability and peace back to our world. So there's two outcomes for every person. If you're in here today and you're a Christian, you've been spared the wrath of God that is due you because of your sin. You're continually being spared as you walk out of here and, and screw up again at some point. Because Jesus Christ took on that wrath on the cross. He died in your place and he lives to give you power to overcome that sin. And there's the other group of people. Your sin wasn't spared. You, you don't know this God. And you are under his wrath. And if you remain under his wrath, there's going to be a time when he returns and, and we will be judged for our sin. And so if you're a Christian and you see sinning going on, don't be policeman. Trust in God. Live the gospel. And know that He is going to bring balance to it. Pray for their salvation. Pray that the wrath of God was poured out for them in Christ, that they will come to Christ and that they will be forgiven. And if not, you can rest in your heart to know that that sin will be judged when God returns, because vengeance is His. It is our job to love our enemies as He has loved us in the cross of Christ. So those are some practical steps on how we are to love one another. Thank you for paying attention. It was a long list to get through. You guys did great. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer real fast. Heavenly Father, We confess we don't hate sin enough. Lord, where you see sin and, and spew it out of your mouth, we see sin as oh so comfortable. Lord, we just pray. Those of us, those of us who know you, we, we pray that you would continue to mature us, continue to bring us along, that we may grow to hate sin and evil and not to play by its rules. Help us to cling to what is good. And help us to understand how that works in the gospel as you continually speak on our behalf through the blood of your Son. Lord, I pray for those who may not know you here tonight that are just kind of figuring things out, coming here to listen perhaps. I pray that they think critically. I pray that... that that they will ask tough questions, serious questions, and, and search, Lord, you tell us, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. And I pray they would do that, that they would seek and search and that your spirit would soften their hearts, that your spirit would open their eyes to understand the truth in your word, that they would know you, the one true God. And I pray that we as the church would not be a hindrance to proclaiming that gospel, but that we would be able to display it in our lives as we exhibit this gospel-fueled love towards one another. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, our model for self-sacrificial love, Jesus Christ. Amen.